And the sermon title is, I am a servant. I'm not going to ask you to say that, but you've got to mean it if you're going to say it. I am a servant. Amen. Just 15 of y'all uh, are, are ready to serve. Amen. So are you there? Say amen. amen. Okay. But to each one of us, Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the low, lower earthly regions? And he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Verse 11 says, So Christ gave himself... So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up and until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful and scheming. Instead, verse 15, speaking with truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part, each part does its work. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word. May it bless us this morning and inspire us to serve in your kingdom. Amen. So church, the book of Ephesians is a book that starts for new believers that finds their identity in Christ. Paul is writing and he speaks from verses or chapter 1 to 4 about your identity in Christ, being a Christian, and speaks truth and speaks facts into what it is to be a child of God, what it means to be saved, what it means your identity in him. So verse or chapter 4 starts with the practical living the implications of how a believer should behave, how a believer should live, and their function and their role, and this is where we're going to touch on, their function and their role within the body of Christ. Jesus is the head of the body, and we are all brought into that body. So Paul does that whole chapters 1 to 4, speaking about how we are identi- identified as Christians, we are children of God, and then from chapters 4 onwards, he speaks of the practical implications, the objectives, the goal of why we serve him, and why we are who we are, and our function in the body of Christ. So we need to know that we are part of the body. We are part of one body, and we are part of one spirit, and we must be eager to maintain this unity. And bear with one another in love. And see, it's out of that context I'm going to be preaching this morning. See, verse, I think it is, verse 7 says, Therefore grace was given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. We all have unique gifts. But Christ apportions to us a measure. So I think it speaks of basically Christ pouring out to us more of his grace as we grow in him. He gives us more grace as we grow in him. He apportions more grace accordingly as we grow. So my first point speaks directly into this area as some of us need time to get going. We all need some time to get going. We can be in church for a few years, but until we get that nudge to serve and get actively involved, Where do we find ourselves? I would love for everybody of you, every one of you here to get involved in some way. But the reality is some do need time. Some do need time. And I think this is where Paul is speaking that let's let's be eager to maintain unity. 
but bearing with one another. Some people need a little bit more time than others. Some people do need a push. So with that said, we all need time, but we all need to be present at church. We all need a place of worship. We all need a home for spiritual growth. And I like the fact that Uncle Steady actually spoke this morning, speaking about, what was it, Uncle Steady? The first, first principles, or what, what's your class called? The beginner's class. We all need a beginner's class. Where to start? And whether you, depending on whichever level you're at, fundamentally, you need to be in the church. You need to be in the service. So the first point is, we need to be seated for service. We need to be seated for service. So all of you are seated here, and you are seated for service. We must not despise those who are still figuring out their place within the church. And the grace that Christ has allotted to them, or apportioned to them, it is important for them to know, or you to know, that if you sit here, seated here, at some point you're going to have to serve. But we're not going to judge you for just coming and sitting. We thank you for coming and sitting. We know that God has some grace in store for you and for this place that you find yourself in. Before I could stand here in front of you preaching and wearing this collar, this dog chain like Denny is calling, I had to realize the importance of fellowship. I had to realize that I was part of the body of Christ. The first point of entry is through those doors every Sunday at 10 o'clock. First point of entry is through those doors every Sunday at 10 o'clock. It's been seated in the church. Now I know some of you came late, you're smiling. It's okay. But try to be here at 10 o'clock. We need to be placed here. We need to be part of the body of Christ so that we can then be equipped to be part of the building project. You cannot grow. This is going to blow some of you guys' mind. You cannot grow where you are not fed. You'll get it maybe next week. You cannot grow where you are not fed. What does Psalm 1 say? Psalm chapter 1 says, Be planted by the streams of water, which will yield its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do, I love this part, will prosper. So, do be, so to be fed, the psalmist said, you need to meditate on the word of God. See what happens to the wicked, later down in that chapter. Now, I'm not saying that you're wicked, but what happens with the wicked, and let's be honest, if you're not planted, this is what happens to the wicked, right? They'll be blown away. And I'm saying, if you're not planted, you may not be wicked, but if you're not planted, you too might be blown away by any doctrine and word that comes across. So the first point of entry is to be seated for, word, for service. You see, I have seen during this time of pastoring, call it that, I've seen a few people come for prayer. Pray for me. This is not, and that's not going well, and I'm just not sure where I am. And immediately, I can sense within my spirit that this person in front of me that I'm about to pray for has never been placed or rooted or planted or seated in God. So what happens with individuals like that, they believe everything and they open up their spirit to every sort of religion that's out there. They open up their spirit to whatever is available to them and the enemy is right there waiting to snatch them up. The enemy is waiting to run roughshod in and over their lives. And that's when they want to come. And that's why I say to you, church, being seated in the church is an okay starting point. Being seated in the church is a good place to start. Amen? Please note the emphasis is on the starting point. <laughs> that you've got to get, start somewhere. I'm not saying that, you know, all of you must stay there. But it's where you start. Be consistent in coming to church. Take pride in getting an attendance register of fully present. 
been at church. Create within yourself and a few parents, create within your family a discipline to be at church every Sunday. Without question, I knew when we grew up, without question, we had to be at church. Whatever the time was, we were at Sunday school and we were at church. Our extended family, our friends knew, Sunday, we are at church. My father never used to let me go play soccer on a Sunday. The one day I was crying, man. I wanted to go. He said, you be at church. You got to be at church. We got to prioritize being at church. Now this discipline obviously has decreased over the years, especially with COVID coming in and everything being online and in line, eh, Kevin? You know, many opting to watch online rather than being in the presence of fellow worshipers. You want to, nah, I'll watch online or I'll catch the service during the week. But there is something so special of being in fellowship, being in corporate worship. And I'm talking to the camera there at this point in time because you all are here. But you have experienced that special touch of the Spirit being in worship this morning, especially with you guys singing here and playing so wonderfully. Corporate worship is so important for us as believers. You see, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, we must not neglect meeting together as it is a habit of some, but we need to come together and encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is it saying? It says that as we see things happening around us, a wall, things are going crazy, we need to draw people near and come to church. Acts 2 verse 46 says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread, as we've just done, in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You just come, you just show up, turn up here, and the Lord will add to our numbers, and many will be saved. So let's start somewhere. Let's stop hopping around church to church. Let's be seated. I know some of you got your favorite seats in the church. It's okay. But if somebody takes it, don't get angry with them now, right? We need to bear with one another. We need to bear with one another. See, now I lost my place here. We need to start somewhere. We need to be seated. And so I remember when I moved up to Joburg uh, decades ago now, no, I'm joking, just only a few years. I visited a few churches. I went with my brother to a church. I went with my auntie to a church. I went with some friends. Just visited a few churches. And um, at that time, we had family friends that was in LBC that came from Durban, from the church there. And so they were fellowshipping here. And so it was, you know, I think that helped me settle in here when I came up. And once that decision was made that I said, no, this is the church that we're going to fellowship at. This is our local church. That is where that decision was made, and we would just sit back, sit at the back, sorry, week by week, Sunday by Sunday, just sitting there, coming for church. Just coming for church. That's all I did. Week by week, sitting right at the back, and um, what happened was, I think it was Pastor Ian at the time, we was under his ministry, and then Pastor Robert came afterwards, and I remember sitting there, just where that fire hydrant was, and there was a sound desk there, and our family friend now is, is not at this church, but uh, he used to do the sound, he used to do the, the sound, and he said, hey, pardon, help me here, man, so this guy was just passing the buck, he wanted me to come and sort the volume, I said, he didn't have to do it, but just imagine, God, I was sitting right at the back there, God used him to start getting me to do something in the church. All I was doing, literally, <laughs> moving the volume button on the sound desk up and down. He says, no man, if it's too loud, just put it soft. If it's too soft, put it loud. That's all you need to do. And I said, okay, cool, I'll do that. It's not hard. I'll come here Sunday morning, we do that. But you see, within me now, I'm not a person to just do half a job. So I would come for the practice as well. I would come for practice, I would make sure this, and I would start learning the sound desk. I would learn the sound desk. And so I got a, a big appreciation for everybody who is behind the scenes doing the small tasks, the ones who we take sometimes for granted, like the lady that brought me the water. I'm always thankful to you. Thank you, beauty. The small things matter. Remember, the body needs everybody or every part to function. So just don't assume it will be done. 
remember that we need everybody and be thankful and bear with one another. So if you're seated, let it be known that you are seated for service. Your time to take the next step is all in God's perfect timing. Amen? Don't be too hard on yourself, man. Some of you were like, ah, I'm just sitting here and, you know, take time. The Lord knows the perfect time for you to get involved, the perfect time for you to do something. But don't be arrogant and say, no, I'm just going to sit here and watch what they do. Let me hear if this pastor knows what he's preaching about <laughs> before I serve, before I give my tithes, before I give my offering. You know? Be seated there in humility. Know that that's a starting point. Be consistent in your time here. So as I move on to my next point, it's stand up for selection. So the church needs to be a place where children, like Uncle Steady said, you know, you can't be in high school without going to primary school, where children become adults. The church needs to play, be a place where children become adults spiritually. Spiritually. The church needs to always have or offer opportunities for people to serve. And I think we do have a few opportunities for people to serve. We need the people to get involved and the church needs to do that. But most importantly, ensure that fellow believers grow into healthy trees that would yield its fruit. Just like Psalm 1 said, yield its fruit in season and that its leaves will not wither. So in as much as I love Acacia to remain a little eight-month-year-old baby, that's the best time. You know, they sleep, they do nothing, and they look so cute. You just thank the Lord. Oh, they open their eyes, they close their eyes. You so, oh, they cry. Ah, ah. I would love for that baby to stay like that. Won't it? They're so beautiful at that time. They don't worry you. You can actually get some sleep, and they sleep. And beautiful time. But you know, the reality of it all is this child is going to grow. Whether I like it or not, she's going to grow. And so it'll be terrible of me or Natalie to be feeding her milk when she is grown up. It'll be a disservice to me or to, uh, to her for us to do that. Still spoon feeding her things that she can do on her own. Imagine me still dressing her up and sorting her out when she's supposed to be doing it herself. Now, that's our walk with the Lord, eh? That we are in church, we grow in, we're listening to the message, but it's like we've been spoon-fed all the time. Just been, <laughs> you know, asking the pastor to do this, do that for me. I need this, I need that. Never growing, never growing. The church needs to be a place where we let you, as a congregation, grow but isn't it like, just like Jesus who gives us the grace that, yes, we grow in, but sometimes we just want to be held. We just want to be carried. <laughs> sometimes we just want to be spoon-fed. And so he gives us that grace every time, even as we grow and, and, and become more spiritually mature. But the point is this. We are going to grow. And the only proper thing to do as a church now is give the opportunity and give the appropriate meals for the church so that they, you, the congregants, can stretch, can grow, can flex, can see where your strengths are, see what you're good at, see where you're going to function in the church, see where, you know, and that's where I think a lot of leadership comes in because the leadership of the church needs to be able to give people opportunities to see, okay, guy, you want to do something? Here's an avenue. Maybe try this, try that. See where your strengths are. And then see where you can actively get involved. And that's where we come in, in terms of serving and making sure you are growing as a believer. So very quickly, a healthy church body functions out of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And uh, maybe you can, Acts chapter 2, oh, it's there. It talks about teaching, talks about fellowship, talks about communion and prayer. Now, Linda's Baptist Church, if you come in for the first time, we want to welcome you. But we operate under four pillars, basically based on Acts 2.42, but we've modified it a little bit. You can check out, check out our website. Can you put the website up there, Palessa, if it's not too hard? You can have a look at 
our website and the four pillars that we have. And I'll just put a plug in there for our brother Mike, Mike the drummer. He's doing a phenomenal job on the website. So um, it's not the finished ar article. We're still working on a few things on the website. But if you need a website for your own business and stuff like that, you can speak to Mike, the drummer. And uh, Mike, you'll give us some uh, of your proceedings. If people give you jobs, you send it back to the church, eh? <laughs> Amen. But um, I don't know. You can't, you can't get it, eh? Paul said it's fine. But on the website, you will see the four pillars. One is edification, which is preaching and prayer. And, you know, prayer is actually essential. It sort of undergirds every pillar. But you have edification there and discipleship following under that category. We've got explosive worship. And you've just witnessed that. I won't say much more. But also remember that worship is not just coming and singing a song here. Lifting our hands. And that's just corporate worship we do on a Sunday morning. Worship is worshiping in spirit and in truth. It's our daily lives. Romans I think 12, chapter 1. Um, evangelism is another pillar there where we, I think we fall in a little bit short here on the evangelism, to be honest with you. And we're going to pick it up in 2024. You know, our corner used to do a, a fantastic job uh, with Uncle Bob, and they would go out in the streets handing out the challenge newspaper. So we do need to pick that up. So that's one of our pillars, and we need to do step up there. So pray along with us there as we try and do more evangelism. I will say that our social media presence has taken, taken a lot of uh, traffic and we've been doing well there, but I still feel on the ground we can do better. We have done prayer walks um, and, and so on. So, but let's see how this year develops, especially with the pillar of evangelism. So that's an opportunity to maybe somebody there who's listening to me. Uh, the fourth pillar is engaging in community, connecting, like we've got the IEC here. The church is not just for us, but it's for the community. It's for the police forum, I know uh, Sister Tandy is, is, is running with that now. And uh, we had Kevin yesterday out, soup kitchen, letting the community know that the church is still alive and we're still a light and we're still trying to help. And we want to get involved with schools as well and try and help in that area and talk to business people. And uh, some of them have already come in with Nazarene and a few of her friends helping the youth. So we're engaging in community and helping the youth to like with their career opportunities. And so in general... The church, Linda's Baptist, is engaging in community and trying to be available to connect with those people in and around us. And that's what we're about in terms of just the four pillars. So I say all that while you're sitting there to say that there is an opportunity for you to stand up and make a selection. Stand up for selection. Say, yay, yeah, I'm here, I want to volunteer and do something. So in order for the body of Christ to grow and be built up, we need people to stand up. I know you're quiet because you don't want to stand up, but it's fine. I'm not saying stand up, literally. But look at verses 11 to 12, which says, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, not to just stand here and preach to you, but to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Everybody who knows me, who works with me in the church setting, they know that we don't, I just don't do everything for you. At some point, you're going to have to run with it. We're going to give you the tools, but at some point, you're going to have to run with it. You're going to have to be equipped. I'm only here to equip you to do what you need to do, to grow and to build this, uh, the church of God. Do you see that in as much as the church leadership needs to provide good food, the opportunity and opportunities, like the four pillars, ultimately the goal is for you to grow. You're going to grow either way. And so we're here to give you the good food, but you need to eat it. And you need to grow and do likewise. A lot of times, the so-called five-fold ministry can begin at home. You can begin at home. Cultivate within your home a healthy lifestyle of prayer. Cultivate within your home uh, a healthy lifestyle of devotion. Get your kids together. Read a Bible story. Speak or just pray together. Go a step further. If you feel now you've, you've passed that area, go a step further and start influencing and ministering in your social circles or on social media. You can even copy what we say up here. When me and Pastor Martin, you take our material and go, go use it. Just do a better job with it. That's all I'm saying. All right? Copy what we're saying. Use it. 
to edify the kingdom and to be a part of growing the church. Many believers have missed this verse, excuse me, verses 11 to 12 that says to equip. We like the pastors, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, but we forget the word to equip. That's the goal, is to equip. And I say that because people start putting a lot of demands, not that you are putting any demands on me, but I've seen it happen that they put so much demands on pastors, they could be doing things themselves. Pastor, come pray for my son. Hey, can't you pray for your own child? You get it? We need to equip people to be pastors of their own homes. Take care of their own families. You get it? Yes, we'll come every now and then and help and but the reason is to equip you guys so that you can function within the body. It's already February, not February, February, but the year has only begun. So I'd like you to go forth this year and stand up for selection. If you feel you need to be active, step up. Come and talk to me. Come and talk to the elders. And let's get going with wherever the Lord wants you to serve and to be involved. Remember, there are different kinds of gifts that take, and um, I'd like you to take a look at a few verses, not now, but in your own personal devotional time. Pray over these verses. See where your strengths lie and see how God may use you. So the verses are uh, 1 Corinthians, I think it's on the slide. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and 1 Peter chapter 4. This speaks of the gifts that believers will have. And so see, where's your strong point? And then we can get talking and see that how we can use you in the church and we can pray and then we can fast track the kingdom plans that LBC has in this community. So if you've got ideas, you've got plans, one, two, three, let's get ready to run with it. Amen. Don't just tell me and then I must do it. No, no, we're going to do it together. And at some point, you're going to run with it. You're going to go with it. Oftentimes, it's actually, and this is a nice part, it's actually when we do the work, do we get to know Jesus more. You got that? We learn, we read the scripture, but when we practically apply it in our lives, do we actually see the time it takes to get something done, the work that's involved, and the rewards as well? We can see it for ourselves, and we can also see the challenges and the struggles. So when we see verse 13, it goes on to say that we will all reach unity in, faith, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What verse 13 is saying is when we start actively getting involved, we start to actually see Jesus working in our lives. We start to get to know him more because now you're actively being involved. And when you're actively being involved, you start to mature as well. That's why we write exams, unfortunately. You know, I know the matriculants are like, thank God for last year, we're done with that. But you learn, but you have to take the test at some point. So we stand for selection and we start to get to know Jesus more. And that's a very insightful and cool thing to have that understanding. It's like we read the Bible, but now when you're serving, you actually see what is said there coming to pass. The Bible is about Jesus and what you start to see in the Bible, you start to see, wow, he's actually working in my life and in this ministry. By practicing what we read, we also get to know Jesus and slowly but surely we start maturing and attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so I'm almost finished. And as a final point, I felt it necessary that we need to serve by the Spirit. So you sit, you are seated for service and then you stand up for selection. But in all of this, we need to serve by the Spirit. The main ingredient to serve by the Spirit is love. Now many struggle or find themselves in conflict and struggles within the church circles when we end up do serving. We either find the church ministries are, you know, 
I don't like this, I don't like that, or whatever it may be. You might have conflict in the ministry that you're serving in. But we need to do it out of love. Because when we serve, we need to have a loving environment that we can operate in and function in. Amen? And also, the flip side, we also got to be loving as well when we're working with certain people. We have to serve by the Spirit, and the evidence is shown by our love. The title of the message is, I am a servant. So when we look at Colossians chapter 3, which gives you uh, verse 22, verse 25, to 25, uh, Palestra, if you can bring it up there. It basically instructs us, uh, chapter 3, verse 22. It instructs us that bond servants or servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service or, pe or as people pleases, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Verse 23 says, whatever you do, work heartily in it, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. So you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25 says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. So now, if Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 to 25 says that for our earthly people, our, the guys that we work for, our bosses, <laughs> how much more serious should we take serving in the kingdom of God? Knowing full well that our Lord himself will reward us because we are his servants. So I stand before you this morning as a servant of Christ. And I can boldly say that. I was at the back there seated, you know. And I would help out in the, you know, the, the sound. And, and trust me, it wasn't as grand as Palesa and Paolo. You've got a nice platform there. You know, I had a normal chair and a little desk that I was operated from. You've got it a bit better now, guys. But all I'm saying is that, you know, I had a small desk there and I just got more involved. It took a few years, but slowly, surely, maturity started happening. That nudge of the Spirit started happening, that I had to do more in the kingdom. So as I started to see more of grace being imparted to me, and the more gifts that I had was being unearthed, I recognized and I saw that I need to do more. And that's where, and that's how, I guess, I came to be where I am. One thing led to another, and yeah, I stand before you <laughs> preaching God's word. So in as much as I like to serve with diligence and integrity, with passion and sincerity of heart, I need to be constantly reminded that, hey, Byron, you need to serve with love as well. You need to serve with love. You need to be led by the Spirit. We need to be led by the Spirit. And the evidence of that is love. Because the more public I become, the more public, you know, setting I am in, there's more eyes watching. And I'm eyes serving, knowing that there's people watching me, so I please the eyes that are watching me and please the people that are here. Or am I serving out of true humility and love for God? So if I am truly led by the Spirit, if I am a servant of Christ, my language needs to be truthful and one of love. I like the fact that it says truth and love because sometimes truth can be hard. Truth can be mean. Truth can be, I don't like that. But you got to do it with love. We got to speak truth and speak it in love. And when this is in place, all the plans and all the visions we have for the church and the ministries have for their particular ministries, Watch what happens in verse 16. It says that the whole body will grow and build itself up because of love. That's the key. So I'm going to close in just these two lines that says, the month of February, February, I'm getting confused with your name. The month of February is synonymous with love. Valentine's Day. Eh? Some of you looking for chocolates and roses and all that goes on with it. 
But can I press upon your heart this morning and this month that out of love, we become more unified and more in love with the body of Christ and the church and declare we are servants of Jesus Christ. And will we serve by his spirit and speak and act in love? Can we do that for this month of February and going on that we speak and we act in a way of love? And I believe by doing that, we can unify the body of Christ and we can grow and build it to what God actually sees LBC being in the years to come. So let's bow our heads and pray. Before I pray, I'd just like you to figure out where you are. Remember, we, we, there's grace. And so we're going to bear with one another. Don't feel a heavy judgment con coming upon you because you're just seated for service. That's your starting point. If you feel you're just seated for service, you're going to take up the challenge to be consistent in coming to church. If you feel that nudge a little bit more harder, that you need to stand up for selection and pick your hand up and say, I need to do something in the kingdom. How do I do it? Come and speak to me. Speak to the elders, Uncle Kevin, Uncle Kay, Uncle Steady, and we can guide you and we can walk with you and see where your strengths are. But you also need to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 4 and see your gifting. We need people to work within their giftings. And then lastly, we need to do it out of love and not selfish ambition. So Lord, we just come before you this morning having an understanding that I am a servant of Christ and that we are required to serve in some capacity in your kingdom. So I pray, Lord, that as you give us grace that's apportioned accordingly to each one of us, I pray, Lord, that you will stir within us a spirit of grace, a spirit of service, that we can find ourselves, Lord, in a place where we just need to be more consistent and then we can grow into a place of service unto you. And when we do that, Lord, let's do it out of love for one another so that we can build and not break the church of God. There's so much of division, Lord, in many churches and many homes, all because love has not taken precedence. So I pray, Lord, that this will be the focal point of our lives, especially as people celebrate Valentine's Day and giving gifts of love and showing their adoration and admiration and um, just being romantic with one another. I pray that we will find the true essence and the true meaning of love that is in Christ, that he shed his blood for us to die for us so that we may be forgiven, but we may be reconciled into him and into a relationship with him, one of love and care. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church, and I'll hand over to the worship team to give you the benediction. Thank you, Pastor Byron. Please stand, church, as I give you the benediction.